Alright, hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Porter County Perspective, the show that highlights the people, places, and events that make Northwest Indiana an incredible place to live. I'm your host, Olivia Calloway, and this week my guests are from the Challenger Learning Center. Welcome to the show, guys, and thanks for coming in. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, can you guys please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do at the Challenger Learning Center and the background that led you there? Sure. Um, so, my name is Laura Bates. I'm the Executive Director for Challenger Center. A little bit about myself. Uh, I used to teach environmental education, ran an environmobile program where I went into the schools, taught about composting and recycling, moved on to work for the Field Museum doing communications, and then uh, a position opened up at Challenger Center, and I was hired to do some community relations stuff. Then soon thereafter, the director position became available and was asked to stay on board and do that role. Oh, okay. Commander Greg? Yeah, my name is Greg Karras, and I was a teacher for 37 years. I actually started teaching at uh, Bailey School. Oh. Back in the day, I was a student teacher there, and I subbed uh, for a year. And then I was at Morgan Township for 11 years, and I was at Valpo Schools for 26 years. And I came to the Challenger Center, believe it or not, 10 years ago. And I had um, you know, the opportunity to fly these missions and work in these labs, and it's the greatest retirement job that you can imagine. Yeah. He's the most seasoned stem educator on our staff oh really yeah he's flown the most missions yeah yeah we're happy to have commander greg so can you remember what first inspired your love of stem which for our listeners is an acronym for science technology engineering math and can you tell us a little bit about the importance of engaging students with the experiences offered by the challenger learning center so i had to think about this one and i was i was always interested in science um, but I think my first gravity assist, someone who really pushed me into science, was Mrs. B. She was an awesome high school biology teacher at Griffith High School that I went to school at. Um, and she was very much a asking questions. Hey, let's go ahead and try it and let's do it. Um, so that first inspired me. I didn't really get into the whole space exploration until I came board uh, for Challenger Center. <laughs> Um, but yeah, what about you, Commander? Well, um, I was in the second grade, and I can remember this vividly. Second grade. I went to Elliott School in Munster, Indiana, and uh, the teacher, Mrs. Thorne, said, line up, we're going to the basement. And the basement was where the cafeteria was. And we get in line, and what are we doing? It's nine in the morning. It's not time for lunch. Why are we going down to the basement? And we walked downstairs, and they turned on these TVs, and they were little black and white TVs at that time, but it was Walter Cronkite, and it was, you know, one of the Mercury astronauts going up, either Gus Grissom or oh, wow. you know, John Glenn, and we watched that on TV, and here I am, a second grader, and I'm just astounded. Like, wow, look at these guys that are sitting on top of this big missile thing, and it blasts off in the air, and we kept, of course, watching those all through the Mercury program mm-hmm. and the Gemini program. By the time I was in high school, they, you know, were flying to the moon, and that was in mm-hmm. ninth grade when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon. And I was just fascinated by that stuff. And um, ever since then, it's been almost like a hobby. You know, I, I taught a summer school class in Dalpo for 17 years where we built and launch rockets. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's just, it's such an exciting, vibrant field to see these mm-hmm. people. And, you know, and we talk about the inequities. Like, you know, the Russians sent up Valentina Tereshkova in 1963. Sally Ride couldn't go up in space until 1983. 20-year gap. Why did that happen? And so we'll talk about that with the kids that, that come to the center. And uh, it's it's just a, a really fun place to work. All right. So before we get further in depth, can you tell us a little bit like an overview of the Challenger Learning Center? Sure. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, hands-on, minds-on STEM education opportunities for really learners of all ages. So from pre K all the way up to, you know, 99 years old and above. But so we take them using the vantage point of space exploration. So it's really STEM and all its capacities, but we focus on space exploration. And Challenger Centers, uh, you guys might be familiar, Challenger Centers are across all the United States and even internationally. We are the only one in the state of Indiana. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Good explanation. (laughs) <laughs> hands on minds on and probably some of the students that are listening or even throughout the community um they might be familiar with one of our flagship programs which are simulated space missions oh yes yeah, you take on roles of scientists and you get in um immersed in mission control and the spacecraft and and commander he's in charge of the spacecraft commander mm-hmm. greg over here so and and that's so much fun because there are visual components to it but then smoke comes out of some of the machines and red lights come on and buzzers ah, 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 and the realistic nature of the experience and you'll have kids come up to you fifth and sixth graders 
at the end of the mission I'll say, well, was that real? Did we, did we really? <laughs> were we like, what do you think? And so um, that's what makes it so appealing because uh, the nature of the almost virtual reality that mm-hmm. they're experiencing. It's not just pre- presentation. It's very hands-on. It's very immersive. Did you... Go through the challenger I, I did actually, yes. Do you remember, you remember what, what you, remember you did at all? Uh, it was a very long time ago, but I do remember doing the simulated mission. Okay. Were you a middle school kid or were you an elementary kid? Do you remember? Uh, must have around a fifth grade or something. Okay, okay. yeah. So. But what most of the um, students that we see are fifth graders from. Instagram. So, what elementary school were you at? I went to Westchester. Okay. Okay, nice. yeah. Westchester right. still comes to us. Actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, that's pretty cool. And so. Um, you know, we've had kids, one of the students that used to be on our flyer when we grew up, this uh, Studebaker kid, he came in fifth grade, mm-hmm. and now he works for the Raytheon Missile Corporation, oh, wow. making things. And he he says on the flyer, you know, I was inspired as a fifth grader by coming to Challenger. So when you hear a story like that, you think, wow, here's a kid. Mm-hmm. He was 10 or 11 years old. He came. This happened. Inspiring minds, planting seeds, and okay. engaging students in STEM. Yeah. So, where is this branch of the Challenger, Challenger Learning Center located, and when do you guys, like, open? Okay. Um, we are located on the campus of Purdue Northwest um, in Hammond, and uh, we are open Monday through Friday from 8 to 4, although we're not re- necessarily open to the public. You have to kind of schedule the programming mm-hmm. in advance. We don't have, we're not like a museum or a science center where you walk in, you pay a general admission of $8, and there's, like, hands-on exhibits for you to go through. Um but we do host like community events and public events like our laser light shows and planetarium shows and um, some community open houses where kids can explore some hands-on activities and stuff like that. But um, most of what we do is the Monday through Friday, 8 to 4, our field trip groups. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another good explanation. <laughs> Thanks, Commander Craig. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about the history behind the learning centers? And how they came to be. Do you want to talk about well, Chan? Because you, know, you were you were around when I mean I was too, but I don't remember that whole. Ch- you know how Challenger Center got their name? Uh, I have a yeah. Okay, maybe okay. you could talk well, about I can that. Give you a little bit of background. Yeah. When I was teaching back in the 1980s, President Reagan comes on TV and says, "Well, you know, space travel has advanced far enough. We can now send a private citizen up in space, and our goal is to send the first teacher." And you know that was this whole teacher in space program. I signed up for that. And, you know, it was like an 11-page application, which I actually kept. Look, and oh, wow. And it's really kind of an interesting. Typed up on a typewriter. Yeah, and, and this was before a computer, <laughs> so this was typed on a typewriter. And I sent it in, and I waited for months, and then I get the reply. Congratulations, you've been selected as an Indiana semifinalist, you know, oh, wow. for the teacher's way. And I was all excited. And then they said, well, the next step is we're going to choose 10 finalists for the state of Indiana, and then we're going to choose 10 national finalists. And... Um, you know, you're still in the running, so congratulations. And I waited and I waited and I got the message and it was uh, not advanced. Uh-huh. Not ten. So I was really disappointed. But then they sent me another communication and they said, we are holding an educators launch conference in January 1986 to watch the challenger. Would you like to come down and watch the launch? And I said, yeah, that would be so cool. And I talked to my wife and we didn't have enough money. Uh-huh. So I went to my principal, was Paul Moff, who came up, he used to be the uh, assistant principal at Westchester Middle School, and then he moved out to Morgan Township. And he said, Don't worry about that. We'll get the PTA to fund you. So they funded me, and I got to fly down to Florida, and we were there for a week. And, you know, we're waiting for the challenger. This Kristen McAuliffe was the high school teacher from out east, and she was chosen, and it was this big thing. She had a backup named Barbara Morgan, Barbara Morgan, and we got to meet her. And there were these, you know, scientists talking to us and people who had designed the space shuttle main engines. So cool. And the flight got delayed one day. There was mm-hmm. a little thing, and there was weather delays. And then they said, oh, I'm sorry, the launch conference is over. And I went, we had to go back home. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting in my classroom and, you know, giving a spelling test. And the kindergarten teacher comes in and she goes, did you see? And I went, no, wait, did they launch? Are they up in space? Because they kept delaying it. And even though when the launch was going to be, she said, no, they're all dead. And I went, what? She said, the space shuttle blew up. They're dead. Well, the back story of that is... June Scobie Rogers, who was the wife of the commander, Dick Scobie, was there, and they're watching their loved ones go up, and here's this mm-hmm. fireball, I don't know if you've ever seen tapes of that, tragic. and this tragic thing, and all seven of these astronauts die. The story that we heard, and you got to just talk to her a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, you mm-hmm. guys were national, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and she's this wonderful person. She gathered all of these families together in a room, 
And she said, we've got to do something. I don't want just to have a statue or a plaque in Washington, D.C. I want to do something so that our loved ones are never forgotten. And within a couple of hours, they had already conceived of the idea of we're going to make a learning center where kids can come. We're going to learn about how this disaster happened. We're going to tell kids, you know, how STEM works and the history of space exploration. And so the first one, if I have my history right, was down in Texas. Texas, right. And then they made more and more. And it was, there used to be more than 40. I think there's only down to 35 centers now. Is that there's what I saw? Four, I, think, mm, well, I think there's about 40 okay. still. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, I don't know the exact number, but they're all over, as Commander Laura mentioned before. Mm-hmm. One in Korea, one in England, some California. Yep. There used to be two in Indiana. There was one down by Indianapolis. But yep. That one closed down. And, um, you know, their vision was to to have a place where kids like when you were a kid in grade could come and and learn about what happened. And we tell the kids, frankly, what happened. You know, there's Mm -hmm. there's tragedy, the teacher and space site, and then triumph, the Neil Armstrong side, we went to the moon and it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, we tell the kids it's based on how people perform and, you know, sometimes mistakes happen, but we have to, you know, learn from those mistakes to to learn how to avoid them. Mm -hmm. And and just one more little side story. When I was down there for that educators launch conference, there was this one engineer named Lee Solid. I remember he, he he told this story about, you know, NASA would hire engineers who grew up on farms. And somebody asked him, well, why is that Lee? And he said, because they knew how to work hard. <laughs> They'd have to get up and look early in the morning. And they had to be smart to become engineers. So he told us in this, he, he had this, um, you know, session in the big auditorium and he looked out the window and you could see the space shuttle on the launch pad. And he goes, let me get this straight. All you teachers signed up to go up on that thing? And we went, yeah. And he goes, why the heck would you do that? And we said, well, the excitement, the adventure. And he goes, excitement, adventure. He goes, I've been working on these things since John Glenn went up in the early 60s. I wouldn't go up on one of them for all the tea in China. And we looked at him and we said, well, Mr. Sopin, why not? And he said, those things are not operational. They're experimental. The airplanes that brought you down to Florida, those are operational. Do you know the difference? And he said, I can guarantee you that one of these days, one of those things is going to blow up and it's going to look like the 4th of July fireworks in your backyard. Four yeah. days later, that's what happened. And I, wow. I I mean, I was riveted by him saying that to us during mm-hmm. this presentation. He knew that things could go wrong. And, you know, actually this engineer, Alan McDonald from Warm Thackall, he told him, hey, if it gets too cold, don't launch because the rubber and the O-rings will get brittle and gas can escape. Mm-hmm. It was 26 degrees and they still launched. So, yep. you know, people do In them, Florida. Tell, in I mean, Florida, it is yeah. unseasonably cold. Yeah, and we tell kids, you know what, that that was an error. And yep. an error happened in 2003. But the Columbia. pressure was on and the media wanted to see yeah, that shuttle go, go up. Oh, there was so much, space, you know, and, yeah, and, hype. Of, yeah, they wanted to continue. They wanted yeah. to persevere, even though they should have pulled the plug yeah, out. Yeah, and, and, you know, he, and, he, and he said, you know, I'm not going to sign off on this flight. And his boss above him signed off that they could fly. And they flew the mission, you know, and it was a disaster. And, and 17 astronauts have actually died. Seven on Challenger, seven more in Columbia in 2003. And way back in 67, there was the Apollo 1 fire. So it's a dangerous enterprise. And yep. we tell kids, you know, it's like joining the military. When you join the military, mm-hmm. bad stuff can happen. You know, you're, you're potentially risking your Risky life, business. But, yeah. Would you ever go to space? Uh, I don't think I would. Yeah. I, as far as I go, I would go is what we do at Challenger Center. Yeah. Well, and you it's know, fine. It's fine. Run simulated and, yeah. space missions. Mm-hmm. That's where that's where uh, my threshold goes to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I apologize for going on so long about that, but it's pretty fascinating that, you know, this that's good. The commander's, you know, spouse right there at the moment yep. of the tragedy said, hey, let's do something to honor these. Yep. Something really good came out of something absolutely awful. Oh, yeah. So we are a living memorial. Um, and we, and we, like you said, we share that with the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I believe you guys actually answered this question earlier, but uh, how many learning centers are there besides the one in Hammond? Okay, so I guess there were a couple that closed. So I, I mean, we'll say 40. We'll Some say 40, range, yeah. but in every Challenger Center is structured very differently. Exactly. So we are, we are what's called a standalone center. As a nonprofit, you know, we have program fees. So students come to us, they pay a program fee. Um, we have grants and educational partners that, you know, help contribute to help with the costs of our center. Other Challenger Centers, most other Challenger Centers are under a university umbrella. So they're funded through the university or they're part of a school district. We are true standalone. So our fundraising, our program fees, it's very much we are on our own when it comes to that, which makes it quite challenging, um, but also pretty 
and pretty cool too. I mean, we were able to have the when you're underneath the university umbrella, you might have to abide by certain rules and regulations, <laughs> and we can kind of diversify our teaching, our curriculum, and kind of what we do. Right. So, and, and something really neat about our center, we have two simulated spacecraft. Yes. Most of them only have one. Yep. So we can have sixty kids come in at once. Thirty of them going to the spaceship. Three of them going to that spaceship, and so we can handle a lot more visitors that way, which is an exciting part of it. Mm -hmm. And my boss is too um, modest to probably tell you a lot of it is fundraising. And yeah, you know, just this last summer, we got a hundred thousand dollar grant from Mipsco, and just this last week, she earned a two hundred forty four thousand dollar grant from the Lilly Foundation. Thank you for oh wow! Grant. And, yeah. and so she writes these grants. And the people see what a compelling program that she has put together. It's not just the missions. We have labs and, like she said, the plant curing shows. And, you the know, learning they, programs. Yeah, we do and, all. And so I'm so proud to be part of it and Aww, honored to work you, with Thank you, Commander. Like this. I really appreciate it. Yes, it yeah. is a lot of fundraising. Um, all to support the kids. Yeah. So what would you say the vision of the Challenger Learning Center is and how do you guys go about fulfilling that? That's a great question. Um, there's a couple different visions, I guess, but my vision, as far as looking forward in the future of what Challenger Center, or I see, I see expansion. Mm -hmm. I see, so, so much of what we do is space exploration. We've kind of added on programs for environmental education components and stuff like that. Like I said earlier, we don't have programs or exhibits for public access. Mm -hmm. I would love to do something where we're welcoming the public in, that we're taking them on tours, that they have... They get to go through the simulator, run a little mini mission. Um, what much of what you would see at an actual science center, very you know hands-on manipulations for all grade levels, something like that. What, and, what do you and, see? Well, and, and it's a really, I mean, the, the stuff that she just described, it's it's already some of it's in place. Mm -hmm. It would be ready to roll. For instance, Jerry Ross, who was this astronaut who was from Crown Point, Indiana, he brought back a piece of the International Space Station. It's this little metal thing, and we have it hanging on the wall. And we tell the kids as they walk by to go into their mission, tap on that twice for good luck, and they tap mm -hmm. on it. And they have, and then we say, you know, you just touched something that flew hundreds of miles up in space. And the whole idea of, you know, her vision of having the public come in, because I get calls all the time mm -hmm. from former students and family members. Whoa, can we just come and visit the center? And, you know, mm -hmm. well, yeah, but, you know, the main thing is these busloads of kids coming in yeah. and doing the missions and going in the planetarium show. So it would be really neat if people could just walk up and just see the stuff. There's pictures of astronauts on the walls. and there. We do have you know, NASA artifacts. We have quite yeah, a bit. And yeah. our colleague, Emma Rose, who has really, during COVID, we applied for um, a couple different grants and a couple different programs to receive certain items. So we have artifacts that we could show off to the public. It's just you know, showcasing in a way. And our space, even though it's 15,000 square feet, we we take up a lot of space with our programming and our, you know, materials and stuff like that. So definitely see expansion, being able to welcome the public and doing more environmental education programs. So, yeah, that's my vision. Yeah. So can you guys tell us a little bit about the types of experiences that the Challenger Learning Center offers to learners throughout the year? You want to kind of go uh, into like the simulated space missions? Okay, well, yeah. So there's basically when kids come in on that bus that we talked about, they're, well, they can come for a variety of things. Sometimes the little kids come for this moon base explorer program and they walk into this moon room and they're digging up for little artifacts and they've got, you know, toys they play with and things they do. And that's not my wheelhouse, but we have these great <laughs> people who work on that. And then they might come into the lab. And so in the lab, they can have a living in space lab or they can have a rocketry lab. And we have a brand new one we just started called Engineering Adventures, where they do these cool Lego spike kits where they build them first and then they program them. And they turn them on and they spin in circles and the lights come on. And so that's the engineering component. But really, the main, main thing, the bread and butter, are these simulated space missions. So the kids walk in and they come into the rotunda and there's a little video that welcomes them. And then they go into a briefing room and for about 15 minutes, you tell them. You know, we're on the moon Phobos, one of the two Martian moons. And we have a base here because Mars has weather that could be dangerous. And so we're going to fly from Phobos down to the surface of Mars. And you tell them what's going to happen. And then they go into this, you know, into the simulated spacecraft and the ship. And it, when it launches, stuff is really shaking and mm -hmm. they take off. And the other kids are in mission control. And then they go through this step. And it's a couple hour, couple hour process of, you know, actually flying the mission. Mm -hmm. And halfway through, they dock with them because something goes wrong. And then you switch, and so the other kids come into the spacecraft. And uh, at the end of the time, the thing that we mentioned before, the kids will often ask, 
Is that this real? really happening? Because, you know, we hand it up. We tell them stuff like... <laughs> We're also we, actors and actresses, yeah, you know? We it, really it, get into there's it. There's a dramatic component to it. Absolutely. And so, you know, we'll tell uh, the kids, you know, well, I don't know, there's a big crisis in the last teacher. You know, as you're busting in the parking lot, you guys should probably go back because we got kicked into the NASA Real World website, and this is actually happening now. And I'm not sure that 11-year-old kids can handle it. What do you think? And then, you know, we can do it. And they, you know, they forge ahead. And so it's really exciting in that. It's exciting. And I feel like it does, it never gets old because, uh, and also another unique thing is we run three different simulated space missions. So right now we're running a program Expedition Mars. So just like what Commander Greg said, that we're, you know, traveling to Mars. And then we run a moon mission. And then we also run a comet mission in the spring. So if they get a variety of missions. If you came here as a fifth grader with, you know, whatever school you, you might come back as an adult and run a moon in a Mars mission. That's mm-hmm. another thing. We run adult missions. So, oh, wow. Really yeah. Fun, yeah. And if you want to, you know, take your sweetie to space, we have that come in February. That's a really, really fun, really fun. Um, really fun. It's kind of kitschy. But, um, you know, how well can you work together with your significant other? And, and then, we jazz it up with the music and they dance and, you know, it's, yeah. it's a thing. So One I'm other fun. thing that happens, you know, we talk about being a STEM facility and then we tell the kids we also turn it into a STEAM facility. So when they come in, they bring a mission patch. The whole class is designed one, and then the kids vote on which one's the best one. Mm-hmm. And we post these up in the briefing rooms, and at the end of the year, we pick the best 15 and we put them online. And, you know, I mean, some of the ones They're I brought really to show, mm-hmm. some of these oh, wow. kids are incredible artists. And now you they know. use, you know, uh, computers and stuff to yeah. digitize but things. Ju- and- just the idea that, you know, these mm-hmm. kids are, yeah, I mean, they can do digital artwork. Mm-hmm. But it, it just, once again, it gives that one kid her or his moment to shine. Like, wow, you had the mission patch. And and some of the teachers are so into it, they'll have t-shirts made with the kids' yeah. patch on or they'll bring, you know, oh, wow. every kid will be wearing a badge when they come in that they've made out of mm-hmm. the mission patch that they designed. So we have some really incredible teachers who've been coming for years and they really get into it. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. But also as the, as the students take on these roles as biologists and medical professionals and navigation specialists and everything, they're also utilizing the 21st century skills. So think of, you know, problem solving, critical thinking, teamwork, communication, all things that we hear from employers that they need the workforce to focus on. And that's mm-hmm. something that we, we, you know, instill as the kids. It really, and some of the teachers will say, wow, I've really seen a student shine like, you know, maybe someone that wasn't that like that was a little bit shy and timid, but now they're the communications officer, and they have to otherwise they have to be able to communicate, communicate clearly, and be on their game in order for otherwise the mission's gonna it's gonna break down. Mm-hmm. Communication's gonna break down. That mission's not gonna be successful. So it allows them to kind of you know challenge their skills. So it's a lot of fun. Each mission is different, but it's similar. But it's different because right. it's all different students. And it's new for them every time. Yes. I mean, I've flown hundreds of missions because I've been there 10 years, but I'm still excited when I come in because I yeah. think, wow, you know, what's going to happen? What's this kid going to do? Man, Greg has the most energy. <laughs> for an old senior <laughs> Yeah. Cool. So which age groups benefit from a visit to the Learning Center? All and, age groups. Yeah. I say all ages. So we have the little four-year-old preschool kids coming in for yeah. the moon-based explorers. Mm-hmm. And then you can have you know, the second or third graders come for this engineering adventure thing with the Legos. Mm-hmm. And then you have fifth and sixth graders who rocket through that. We're living in space. We had eighth graders from Michelle Obama school the other day. Yep. We've had high school kids. We've had high school kids. Office. We have college yeah. students come school in started. from uh, different universities that run missions, that work on their team-building skills. We have adults come in and yeah. challenge... I, Right. I Corporate would say missions. that the wheelhouse is like fifth and sixth graders mm-hmm. most of the time. Most, most of, of the, the students that we see are fifth and sixth grade. That is but, correct. But like, for instance, I'm in the Kiwanis Club in Valparaiso. We flew a mission with adults and we brought in dinner and we flew the mission and, you know, we went and saw the planetarium show at the end. And these people are, you know, in their 60s or 50s like me and they loved it. They, they had a great time. Yeah. So we make it fun. Ages, we make, that's one thing that's very special, I think, about our center and probably a lot of other centers, but our staff is amazing. But science can be very intimidating or mm-hmm. math can be intimidating. We create a comfortable atmosphere that, like, you kind of, not that you forget that you're learning, right. but it makes it fun. Mm-hmm. It's, it's education and entertainment combined. So That's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, sometimes yeah. the math is beyond what I know, too. Oh, jeez, yeah, yeah, please. And you, just, you know, we, we just say, well, we're going to work on this as hard as we can, and if we don't get to every single step of it, 
I think we'll still be able to find a way to push through and, and mm-hmm. accomplish the goals of our mission. So. We really try our best to make every student feel successful and they contributed to the success of the mission. Whether it's, you know, hey, you really did a great job with communicating that or you, you know. Yeah, I, I can give one really cool example. During the mission, the oxygen system on the spacecraft fails. Mm-hmm. So the red light comes on, ah, 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 emergency. And then it says 50% oxygen left on board. And then 30 seconds later, 40%. And there's this excitement and like, we have to figure out. And they're resetting the system. Well, it comes down to the fact that there's a missing key to reset the final leg of the system. And they have to find it. Well, the other day it was so exciting because the kid who found it, the key's hanging up on a hook about six and a half feet away up high, you know, and, and this kid couldn't reach so I said, well, you found it. Now what? I have to get somebody taller. So she got another tall kid, and he reached up and got it, and then he handed it to the life support person, and then she stuck it in, and then, okay, turn it on three. And so I said, do you guys see what teamwork is? She found it. She got a tall kid to get it. He gave it to her. They put it in, and we're now we're alive. And then you get on the, the fake radio, and you say, how much air was left? There were seven seconds of breathable oxygen left on board the ship. And the kids, they'll, I've, I've had some kids who, like, hyperventilate. Yeah. Kids yeah. will come up and go, I, I didn't think I, I could bring him in her. So it, it, it's really fun and exciting. It is fun. Yeah. It's very fun. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about what a kid could experience on one of the mission simulators in the field trips? A lot more. Well, I mean, it depends on what role they take, but... You can go through the different jobs. Yeah. yeah. I, and I got to remember because I haven't flown a mission well, in quite, I, I in quite some time. Yeah. But the so. spacecraft, so mission control, I'll talk a little bit about. So one class, we can take up to 34 students at one time. But we'll say half the class is in mission control and the other half is in the spacecraft. So in mission control, just like what mission control does, they're managing the mission from the space flight, from launch to landing and everything in between. Their job is to provide technical support to the spacecraft crew and always, and most importantly, is to keep the crew safe. So in mission control, what they're doing is they are doing some research, learning about what their um, crewmates on the spacecraft, what kind of experiments they're doing, whether it's our biologists that are looking at different soil samples, regolith on the Martian surface, seeing if there's any microbial life in there. Our navigation specialists, they're working on the landing tools. This, we're going to send this rover. We're going to deploy this rover on the surface of Mars. So they're working on those calculations, but they're also they're analyzing what type of information that they're getting from the spacecraft and providing direction to the spacecraft. Like, hey, if there is something, if the space weather is, you know, looks like there's going to be dust storms, we're not going to land on the Mars base. We're going to have to look at a different location. So, right. And, you know, they have robotic arms that they may be manipulating. Or the in the doctors, spacecraft. Yeah, in the, in the spacecraft. Yeah. Or the doctors are going around checking the radiation levels on yeah. the different astronauts. Mm-hmm. Or they're in the rove room and they're building this device. And we tell them, you know, that's $44 million worth of equipment there. And you better not mess up because if you do, it comes out of my paycheck. And, <laughs> and the kids kind of look at you. And, we do you put know, the pressure on a yeah, little well, bit. Yeah, we put a little pressure on And we ask them before they go into these missions, is anybody nervous? And when they tell us that they're nervous, we go, that's good. That shows that you care. Yep. We don't want you to be debilitatingly nervous. Yeah. You know, like you're turning on their system. and oh, Stage fright. Nervous. You want to do a good show. And so, you know, you have a little bit of mm-hmm. trepidation just because. Yeah. So I, I feel like no matter what kind of student you are and what ability levels, there's a role for you at um, Challenger Center to run a mission successfully. And Even, we, had, we had a blind student last week, yep. and we got a really nice note from the teacher afterwards because we made the effort to include that kid in mm-hmm. part of the exciting parts of the mission. Mm-hmm. And we've had kids, you know, they show up and you know, they may be a, a disabled child in a wheelchair. And mm-hmm. you, We have accommodations. Yeah. We very much pride ourselves on being inclusive and trying to uh, provide materials for, you know, sensory friendly and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so... So what should a student uh, walking out of the expender uh, hope to have learned from their time there? Well, learning not just a little bit more about space exploration and maybe Mars or traveling to the moon or rendezvousing with a comet, but also just talking like how to communicate with others, right. and, and how the, to problem the, solve. The perseverance aspect of the mission. Yes. They're, they're going to encounter stuff that they don't get the first time. <laughs> that nope. robotic arm might not work the first time. Or, you know, I, I have to still communicate with my partner down in mission control. So we tell them things like teamwork and perseverance and, you know, what do you do? I don't know if you, there's this new movie out a million miles away. It's about this astronaut guy who was a migrant worker. Still haven't seen it, but it's and on it's my list. it's really well done. He applied to be an astronaut 11 times before he made it. And then his wife is talking to him and she says, well, what do these other people have that you don't have? And he goes through this whole list. Well, they run marathons and they're deep sea divers and they know different languages. 
he does everything that these other people have done, and it takes him years to do it, and he perseveres, and then his wife, you know, he's ready to send in the application, and his wife goes, don't send it. Take it in person. <laughs> so he flies down to Houston, and he walks into the lobby of NASA, and he finds the guy who's rejected him for 11 years, and he hands him the thing, and he goes, back. They go, wait, who are you? And he said, you know what, well, I've applied all these years, and I want you to know I'm serious about this, and he, t- he goes right into it. And he's chosen to be an astronaut. And it's it's a really cool story. So I you know, we, that. we we hope that the kids understand that. Yeah. A lot of times people say, Well, you can be whatever you want. Well, if you're willing to work. Yes. Yeah. You've work hard. In, yeah, and you've got to be able to persevere yeah. and everything's gonna have challenges. Not everything is gonna come to you easy, but if you work hard and yeah, you can you can get things done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what we, do. we hope to inspire and, you know, Peak curiosity in kids' minds. I remember one day there was a, a electrician guy. He was doing some work in the lab, and he was talking to me. And he goes, "Oh, you worked here?" And I said, "Oh, about six years at that time." And he said, "My daughter came here twelve years ago." And he, he said, "It changed her life." He said she didn't like school. She didn't. And he goes, "After she came here, everything was different." And I, I looked at Aww. that guy and I said. I want you to write that down. <laughs> that's a great saying, testimony. Yeah, that you know that she found something in that two and a half hour experience where mm-hmm. like, yeah, man, I can focus on something. You know, mm-hmm. She, she mm-hmm. learned something. And it was before the time I had even been there, but it was really neat to hear. Mm-hmm. Even students, like you know, they just build their confidence. You know, right. all of a sudden they take on this role and maybe they solve the oxygen system and then they have this sense of confidence that they can, they did that. you know, yeah, and I they did that. Each other yeah. They kind of like, I love it. Today, yeah. actually, the mission, I was sitting in my office and I heard, yeah, and they were all yelling and screaming. I'm like, well, Karen, I think the mission was successful. Like, <laughs> they were, get so into it. The Michelle it eighth graders? Yeah, yeah, eighth, eighth graders. graders. So eighth eighth graders, graders, yeah, you know? Yeah, it's hard to get them fired up. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's really so. neat. That's a lot of fun. Can you tell that we love what we do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so about how many students does the center engage with annually? That's a great question. So um, this past school year, we reached over 12,000 students at our prime, which I was before COVID in 2018, 2019. We were seeing, we were averaging like 15,000 students per year. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And, at, and actually, we just received an award uh, from Challenger headquarters, so our um, mothership, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, we I think was it num- number two, number two out of all the centers. Yeah. So out of the forty centers or whatever, um, we saw the most students and flown the most missions with students. So and, and that thing we mentioned before, having two simulators helps us there absolutely because we can have a big you know double yeah. bus them at once, and mm-hmm. it's really neat. Yeah. yeah, so we see quite a bit of students. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. So I understand you guys occasionally offer public events, such as the laser shows or the planetarium shows. Can you guys tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we act, we have um, our Fright Light laser shows. Commander Greg, have you seen that before? You know what? I've seen little snippets of it, but not It's like show. your classic Halloween, um, like the Mash. Monster Mash yeah. and... I'm trying to think what else is in there, but it's really cool. Have you ever seen a laser show before? I have it's not. It's synced up to music. It's laser lights on up our on planetarium, planetarium dome. dome. So you're Everybody chilling back. Yeah. You're relaxing. It's very fr- um, family friendly. We have two shows, and I probably should have wrote down the dates, but it's right before Halloween. We're what, doing... 20-something? Yeah, yeah, we're this. doing it on a, a Friday. We have evening shows going on. Um, well, I know we've done, like, Pink Floyd shows and Metallica shows, so, you know... Fans of rock music can come in and they yeah hear we'll their have peace. and then we'll also have the holiday laser lights show which always sells out and that's right before our we we'll be, um, close down the center for two weeks for the Christmas holiday um, but we have that going on as well and we've had other events too a few months back there was a movie that came out it was called Good Night Abby it was about oh, Opportunity Road so that was on Mars mm-hmm. and we had a public event where people could come and watch the film. And it was such a, but you know, people come to those events. We have a big fundraiser every year mm-hmm. and raise a lot of money to mm-hmm. help the place keep going and uh, get a lot of good community support. You can- no, that, that was good. Yeah, we do have a lot of community support. Um, and we're always looking to do more things too. So if there's any organizations out there that, hey, we're having a, a STEM night and we want to have some of your commanders, can we come in with these blue suits and we can just talk about our programs, maybe bring. Commander Greg's uh, rockets or lightsabers and talk mm-hmm. about that kind of stuff. So, yeah, keep us in mind for and, future and, programming. And we, we haven't even mentioned the summer program. 
Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so you could go into that a little bit. But no, Six so weeks of summer camp from um, kindergarten through sixth grade. And then we also run summer STEM, summer enrichment opportunities. So that's where um, groups like the learning centers, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCA camps, they actually take a field trip to our center and run like two-hour hands-on labs that includes planetarium shows as well. So we're always doing something at our center. So what would you say sets the Northwest Indiana Challenger Learning Center apart from the other ones? I know you said there were some internationally. What sets us apart from other challenger centers, I mean, we are a very small organization. We operate at a staff of nine mm-hmm. that's reaching over 12,000 students per school year. That's huge. Like I said, most other challenger centers are under a financial umbrella of a university and or under a, a science center or a school district where they don't have limitations that we do as far as salaries go and resor- just resources in general that are available. So... We are small, but we are very mighty. <laughs> yeah, so that sets, and our staff, I think our staff sets us apart from everybody too, because we're pretty amazing. <laughs> so what are some of your guys' favorite activities and programs that you guys offer? Well, like I, from my perspective, I mean, every time I go to Fly Mission, I'm amped up. You walk into that briefing room and it's kind of like the lights go down and the overhead comes up and... We're on Phobos, you know, ground control. Here's what we, here we are. I love that, but I also love doing the labs because the kids come in, and you know, we start out. We just have these little science tricks we play on them. We I've got this block of wax, and when they flip it over, it's gray and white at the bottom, and there's a shadow that causes it. To, it, it, it confuses them, yeah. and they get their minds going. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's it's so much fun to see how the different age groups respond to it. But uh, there there's just nothing about it that isn't fun and engaging every yeah. every minutes. It's My favorite is the missions because it also makes you, uh, you know, you could run hundreds and hundreds of missions, but you're, you are also being challenged because there's different students, there's different learning abilities. You never know when technology, just like, you know, we were having technology, you know, challenges or whatever, you never know what's going to happen. So <laughs> every time you fly, it makes you a better educator because you have to be able to adjust accordingly yeah. Yeah, and I, run I, with I the was punches. just telling this story last week. Somebody said, what was your favorite day here the whole 10 years you've been here? And it was the day that one of the spacecraft completely broke down and 60 kids walked in two minutes later. And so we were ready to send them home. And this commander, Ann, who used to work there, said, we can do it. We'll put them all in one spaceship. And everybody came in. So we had usually have 15 kids in the spacecraft, 15 kids in the mission control, 30 in each one. And we ran it. And at the end of the time, the teacher said, that was the greatest thing. And it was because, you know, everybody rose to the occasion. We had more flight directors in there. So everybody Mm -hmm. was kind of pulling together. And, you know, just like you ever see the movie Apollo 13. I have not. Well, take a look at it. It's yeah. good. They're halfway to the moon. Boom, big explosion. And they got to figure out how to get these three astronauts back alive. And that's what we did that day. And mm-hmm. it was so exciting because everybody just kind of pulled together as a big thing. We have to implement what we what we expected the students, you know? like yeah. Just we like we you, ask yeah. you to have to persevere through challenges and we struggles, do we do too. And they see it. They see it. So, yeah. So, are there any often overlooked features that you guys would like to highlight? Of the Ooh, overlooked features. Overlooked features. Hmm. I I will often hear kids comment on how cool they think something is. Mm-hmm. You know, like when this rove unit that they're sending down to the surface the surface of Mars takes off, actual smoke comes out of the device, mm-hmm. and then it's like, oh, is, it, is the exhaust working? And actually, Commander Lar just fixed it the other day. It's really <laughs> kind of a neat thing. But you know. Um, just little surprises like that. Like, out the mission will be launching, and there's this red light above. I can just flip the switch and go, rah, rah, rah. and just that little thing. What? And I'm looking at a kid, did you touch something? And they can go over and say, no, I didn't touch anything. Well, why is that light on them? You know, um, just little uh, wrinkles that you can throw into a mission to make it more exciting. Yeah, and I think that's not that. something that you advertise, but it's just something that you they take away. Added like, elements. Oh, a little extra, mm-hmm. extra stuff that was uh, tossed in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to make it more fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And we also do programs for like scout programs that come in. Um, We have an all abilities program. So uh, all abilities. And we just had different ages too. I mean, we've had adults who, you know, Mm -hmm. developmentally disabled adults that 
come in and they, have they a blast. love it. We yeah. do a living living in space modified version of the lab where they're going through different experiments of what your body would feel like, what would you know the different you know you do that mission. I don't know exactly. Yeah. And, they get and to just here's what the food looks like, and we have real packets of astronaut food, and then you put water in. Here's you know the Velcro that they stick stuff onto the wall of the spacecraft. So it yeah, eating space. in space is much different than eating on Earth, and and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we do have a galaxy gift shop. On oh, right. I think that's something that is overlooked a little, uh, bit. Overlooked yeah, a little exactly. bit. It's um, got that cool house, stuff in very it. cool stuff, you know, um, and all different price points. But probably our most our hot item is the space food, the astronaut, the astronaut ice, cream. ice cream. Did you ever have astronaut? Does that I ring have, a bell to you? I've seen it. I've never bought it personally. Oh, I should have brought some with for you to taste it. We'll but it was, it's a hot item, um, and it tastes similar to, and I don't eat this kind of cereal, yeah. but the uh, Lucky Charms Lucky, the marshmallows. Oh. Yeah, like okay, that. so it has that same texture, <clears throat> dehydrated ice cream. It's good. Um, so Kids that's, love it. Yeah. Kids love it. So not every school is required to shop, but all the funding goes to help support our center. And there's all kinds of other stuff in there, astronaut stuff, Challenger logo stuff, NASA mm-hmm. hats, backpack things. Yeah. So, yeah. So do you guys, I know you mentioned you have a Halloween-themed laser show. Do you guys have any other upcoming events that you're excited about? Uh, we're doing Pink Floyd. I don't know if it's Dark Side of the Moon or The Wall, and I should have probably I think looked. it was The Wall. You think it's the wall? Yes, yes, because it has the brick on it. It is the wall. That's coming up in November. Um, I think the best way to find out what we're doing is our social media. And our colleague, Emma Rose, is very good at always posting um, what we have going on. So on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter, and I know we're on LinkedIn as well, but all the tags are at ChallengerNWI. That's where you can find us. And then, of course, our website, clcnwi.com. Okay. Lots yeah. of good information. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And can I just interject one thing here? Uh-huh. Lara and I were talking before we came over. We're really impressed by you because you were so prepared for this interview. Yeah. When we saw your list of questions, I thought, man, this kid's on the ball. Yeah. <laughs> so I, kudos to you. And I don't know if you get, you know, special shout out to your teacher or whoever supervises you. Mm-hmm. It was really impressive how yeah. organized. You can tell you did your research. Well thought yeah. out your questions were so. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Good job. Good job. So, do you guys have any ways for listeners to contribute to the Learning Center, like volunteering or? Absolutely. You know what? We have different. We've kind of modified our volunteer program. If there are students that want to engage with camp summer camp programs, we kind of have to do some background checks and stuff like that. But um, we offer volunteer programs. You can come in and help with summer camps. You can come in and do office work. You can come in and clean. You can come in. And we actually, Commander Maya, who is on the staff now, started out as a volunteer. So these students at Purdue will come in. And she was so good that I think you guys just said, hey. She was great with the kids. And after seeing her in action and, you know. We're like, hey, would you want a position here and help us fly some kids to space? And, and, and she's still a student at the university, mm-hmm. but, you know, she figures out her schedule so that she can yeah. do it too. Or even helping with, like, community open house stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be great, too, just if, you know. Well, you, and it's, it's great, too, just to have some of the volunteers around just to clean up the labs and stuff. Mm-hmm. Or after the mission, oh, I have to wipe down all this equipment and we have to reset it and fold the vest and do mm-hmm. everything that's getting you ready for the next mission that's coming in. Those volunteers are a big help. They are a huge help. Like I said, we're limited on our resources and our staffing. We're a very small staff, so any extra help that we can get, that would be great. Yeah. They just reach out to me or find us on the website. There's a little volunteer and get some info. So lastly, before we wrap it up, is there anything else you guys would like to let us know about the Northwest Indiana Challenger Learning Center? You know, I would just encourage people who are listening to this to try to find out more about what we have done, mm-hmm. a lot of times, you know, the kid in your house has been there. Oh, yeah, I went there in fifth grade. That was really great. And uh, sometimes people who would like to financially support or mm-hmm. in some other way support an organization, you know, maybe it's at the back of their mind. I would just like to bring our organization to the front of their minds. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I, and I was a teacher for 37 years. I've been here for 10 years. It is, it, it's so much fun. And I obviously, from what we've been saying to you today, we believe so much in this mission that we think it's a, a really worthwhile thing to do. And the fact that, you know, she's bringing in these hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars grants shows that somebody else is agreeing with us. So I, yeah. I'm just 
happy to be affiliated with it and we'd just like to get the word out. And that's why we appreciate you inviting us here today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It helps spread the word. And if there's teachers that are listening out there, so, um, you know, educators that, <clears throat> hey, we're, we're doing summer camp with our kids. We would love to come and learn more about the Challenger Center. Like I said, we work really, really hard to get grants to help offset the cost so that uh, financial barrier is not the case that they can't come to our center. So please <clears throat> reach out. Um, we would love to have more students in our building and be able to reach more can, kids. Can you explain how the Blue Origin stuff where we get... Yeah. How does that even... I'm not even fully versed on that, but... We um we were granted funds. It was $6,000 from Blue Origin, Club for the Future. And so missions were basically almost completely free for underserved communities, mm-hmm. Title I schools, um, even homeschool communities. Um, so, yeah, and uh, I'm hoping that that gets renewed in 2024. So right. we'll see. But we, if you if you want to come, we will make it happen. And, and, and she just mentioned the homeschool. Component. Yeah, homeschool. We run special homeschool days. So because there's a bigger population. That's the way they're it has. In, we've seen an increase in homeschool education after COVID, for sure. So there's a greater mm-hmm. demand, and um, we're hoping to build that up as well. All right. Well, I think that's about going to wrap things up for this week's edition of the Porter County Perspective. This has been Olivia Calloway, and my guests this week were from the Challenger Learning Center in Hammond. Thank you so much again, guys, for coming in and being with us today. Thank Thank you, you, Olivia. I really appreciate it.